I felt a little uh, guilty making that because I thought people are going to think, what in the world, did you not have anything else to do this week? Like, <laughs> but the, it was surprisingly, did not take very long to make a fool of myself. So uh, here's the deal. I don't like the word sinner. I don't like the word sinner at all, um, particularly when it's applied to me. I don't know about you, but I don't know if you'd want to wear a shirt that says sinner on it, right? Here's the definition of a sinner. You see it on the screen. It's a person who transgresses against divine law, but then, this is where, ugh, committing an immoral act or acts. You, okay? I hear the words immoral acts, and my mind starts to fill in the blanks with all kinds of different things. I don't like the word sinner, especially when it's applied to, to me, okay? So if I'm a sinner, here's what that means. It means that there was something wrong and then I, what, chose to do it anyway. That's what that means. I don't want to be called a sinner. It makes me feel bad, like a bad person. I don't want to feel like a bad person, okay? That's why instead of sinner, I like a different word. Here's the different word, mistake. A mistake is a wrong action or statement proceeding from faulty judgment, inadequate knowledge, or inattention. Now, that's that's still not great because it means I blew it, right? I made a mistake. But, uh, man, I don't want to be called a sinner. It sounds a whole lot better than sinner. Pastor Andy, Andy Stanley, he once talked about this idea of taking the sin stuff and just saying those are just mistakes. So instead of being a sinner, now we're just mistakers. I'm just a mistaker. I'm not a, I'm not a sinner. A mistake means that it's not inherently my fault. Like, I didn't maybe know what I was doing when I made this decision and so it can't be held against me, right? I can be like, oh, bro, my bad. I, I didn't mean to do that. I'll do better next time. Or maybe we prefer the word accident. Oh, man, that was an accident. I didn't mean it. I had no idea it was an accident. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Or maybe we like the word misstep. I love this word. Misstep gives the idea that, like, just takes away all responsibility. I was just walking along, and literally my foot just stepped in the wrong spot, and it's not my fault, man. I didn't even see it, right? We made a misstep. We had an accident. We made a mistake. I'd rather those sinner things be mistaker things. That's what I'd like. And I'm bringing this up because in our reclamation series, we're asking Jesus to reclaim some truths and then kind of maybe peel off for us some of the layers that maybe we've added to what Jesus is really talking about and then maybe add some things back on that we've peeled off, because they make us uncomfortable. And uh, one of the things that we're going to have to talk about in this series is sin, is sin. And I understand the topic of sin is not popular, uh, but it needs to be reclaimed, because I think we have some misconceptions about it. And because, let's be honest, too, uh, I'd rather be known as a mistaker, not a, not a, not a sinner. And so in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus described the citizen of his kingdom. This is what we've been doing the last few weeks, uh, the Beatitudes. It's countercultural, and it's even religiously countercultural. It doesn't make any sense. The blessed life, Jesus says, the person that's in my kingdom is the person who's spiritually poor. The one who could admit, man, I, I am poor in spirit. Um, and then, then, then we mourn over that poverty. We mourn over the fact that when it comes to spiritual things, we don't bring anything to the table, and we're meek, and we hunger for righteousness, and we're merciful because we've experienced mercy, and we're, we're pure in heart, peacemakers, being persecuted for the sake of righteousness. He describes the kind of a person that's in his kingdom, and then Jesus lays out for us, really, our purpose. So we talked about this on Baptism Sunday a couple weeks ago. We took in a bunch of members and everything, but we talked about the fact that we're called to be salt and light in the world. In other words, we live our lives in such a way that it creates thirst among the people that are around us. They want to know why we're different. It creates something. And light, we bring light into dark spaces. We shine the light of Jesus and his love and his grace and his mercy and forgiveness into the dark spaces of our world. That's, that's our purpose. Okay, but now... Jesus drills down into the sin business, and it revolves around a misconception of what he's really about and about sin itself, okay? So we're going to go through this passage really quick. It's Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. It says this. He's setting some, some things straight here. 
says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He says, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything's accomplished. Therefore, if anybody sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then here's the dinger at the end. He's talking to everybody that's listening to him in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So I used to have a book on my bookshelf. I don't know what happened. I must have given it away. Uh, called They Preached It Straight, I Heard It Crooked. Let me say it again. They preached it straight, but I heard it crooked. And I think we do that a lot of times. And what we have right here in this passage is Jesus straightening out some crooked assumptions and preferences that maybe we bring to the table. And he's straightening all of those things out for us. He says here, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. So what, what is he talking about? What, what does this have to do with anything? The clue is in what comes next. He says, I came to fulfill them. I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill those things. Fulfill them. So long story short, the law and the prophets, they're covered extensively in the Old Testament portion of Scripture, the front half of your Bible. And basically what we need to understand is this. All of that, the law, the Ten Commandments, all the rules you see in Leviticus and Numbers and all those kinds of different things, those should not be viewed as a list of rules. Those aren't a list of rules to be followed. That's not what they are. They're a rescue mission. Those are a rescue mission. So from the very beginning, God has been working to restore and rescue people. That's what he's been doing. Ever since the fall in the beginning, ever since we chose to go our own way, we're pretty good gods ourselves, so we don't need you and, and stuff like that. Ever since we've made that decision, God's been on this huge rescue mission to, to reconcile with us, to bring us back to himself. That's what all those things are, are about. We're going to talk about that here in a second. You don't need any convincing, do you, that like there's some brokenness in our world? You get that, right? That people are broken? I love doing this because I just, it just illustrates this more and more. Our world is broken in 2015, okay, so almost 10 years ago. The number of overdose deaths in the United States is about 45,000. 2015, overdose deaths in the United States is 45,000. Last year, less than 10 years later, it's over 100,000. Over 100,000. At the same time, during that roughly 10-year span, hate crimes have increased, not 40%, not 60%, not 70%, 80% hate crimes have increased in the last 9 to 10 years. Uh, in Indiana, 159,344, so basically 160 grand, 160,000 households in Indiana in 2023 we're behind on rent or house payments. That's a lot of homes, 160,000. Uh, only a couple months ago, a dressed out and armed person stood on a corner in our county seat, Porter County, holding a sign that read, keep the region white. So whether it's in marriages or between parties or nations, there's war, there's division, there's hate, there's all of it. Uh, things are broken, okay? We acknowledge that. Things are broken. But here's the deal. God created us in his image. Perfect love. His image. And yet we are the ones that have tarnished that through that word that we don't like. <laughs> Sin. We tarnished that. So God handed, handed down, he did in the, in the Old Testament, handed down these rules and laws, things to keep people on the path of a healthy relationship with God and a healthy relationship with others. If you spend any time looking at the Ten Commandments, should know the gods before me, don't commit adultery, don't lie, 
don't steal, don't cheat, don't do all these different things. We look at those as don'ts, but don't you think that if we did those, our relationships would be better? <laughs> they're, they're protective, they're redeeming aspects, right? Uh, the prophets would come along and they would remind people of God's promises as well as his law and try to convince the people, look, this is the best, best path to be in good relationship with God. This is the best path to be a good in, re- in good relationship with, with your spouse, with your children, with your, your neighbors, with your, your world. This is the best path. But we like to wander. <laughs> we like to wander off that path. And ultimately, those laws, <laughs> and I get it, I, I'm, I'm as guilty as, as maybe any, I don't know, I'll, I'll admit my own guilt, I won't admit yours. <laughs> um, those are the parts of the Bible that creak when you open them, because we just don't spend much time in them. Okay, the, the, the stuff that's in Leviticus. You want to do a deep dive Go into Leviticus and just spend a day there. And then call me when you're done. Uh, and we'll, we'll have a prayer of recovery or something. Uh, they're just, it just it, you're like, you can't mix this food with that food, and you can't do this, and you can't do that. All of those laws and those rules were designed for a reason. They were designed to create a posture. Follow me here. Those were not handed down from God to create conformity. You follow the rules, and you've conformed now to what God's demands are. That's not what God was after. God was after a posture. It's a posture of repentance and restoration. It's, it's a posture of love and relationship between God and people. Purity and wholeness, peace, love, joy, all of that. All of that. But here's the problem. I like the mints in Ben's office. Okay, that's the problem. And you know what? Even when he asks me not to, I like the mints in Ben's office. I want them when I want. I want them how I want. I want what I want. It sounds like Dr. Seuss, okay? I don't like rules. I don't. I drive 78 into 55. Okay. I want you to drive 55 into 55. But when it comes to me, I know what I'm doing. I don't know if you know what you're doing. I like to determine how those laws and those rules are applied to me, don't you? I like that role. Now, I know I'm picking silly examples, but listen, the stakes go up rapidly, depending on the issue. Rapidly. Like how we relate to people who are not like us. The stakes get higher. Or how we might lie because of our ego or our pride, or how we might tend to gratify gratify ourselves at the expense of other human beings. It gets dark pretty fast. Okay. Now, on that hillside, on, on the Sermon on the Mount, on that day when Jesus was speaking these words, there are some people who were following Jesus on that day, and he was drawing a crowd. They're following Jesus, and they're like, yeah, I like this. I like this. Those laws... Those burdensome things, those things that, that, that those religious leaders keep holding over us saying, see, we do these very well, and you stink. And so they would hold these rules up as these unattainable things. And Jesus, we like what you're saying because it sounds like you're here to get rid of that stuff. You're here to do away with it. And Jesus says, hang on. It's like, I, I understand how you feel, but not so fast. Those aren't bad things. Not so fast. He is not starting a new thing. Follow me here. Jesus is not starting a new thing. Those things in the past, those were designed to try and keep people close to God, but over and over, we fell short. We did not meet the mark. And so Jesus says, I'm now going to live that out perfectly for you. I'm going to live this perfectly for you. Paul tells us in the the book of Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't say all of us have made mistakes. It's not what it says. It says all of us have made some choices, some decisions. If it was just mistakes, well, we could just try harder next time. If there was a list of laws and we're like, yeah, I've kept, 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 I've got to work on that one, this one, this one, this one, be like, I'm going to try harder, God. That way I I can make it. That way I, I make the cut. 
okay? Now, you can fool other people for a while. Here's the problem. God sees what's in your heart. That's what this is all about. God sees what's in your heart. We experience every day the fracture between us and God and us and other people, the pain of it. Not only that, we also experience the death of it. Don't you feel that sometimes? You ever had a relationship die? Because of the pain and the, the injury, the sin? So to restore our relationship with God and each other, <clears throat> God did something. He moved into the neighborhood. Jesus was born, lived the fulfillment of the laws and the prophets perfectly. And then he took our brokenness upon himself. He took it as though he sinned in our place, dying our death so that we could live. And when he beat death, we have a promise now, not only of everlasting life, but we can actually enjoy some real life now. Free from the curse of sin, free from condemnation, free from the guilt and shame that comes with sin, and then filled with the Spirit so that we might actually begin to live out some of the reality of what it looks like to walk with Jesus, what it looks like to have life in his kingdom. It's a relationship restored, not because we tried harder, not because we said, you know, the sins aren't that bad because they're just mistakes. You can't hang that stuff on me. We didn't lower the bar. In fact, Jesus comes along, and in this whole thing, he's raising the bar. He's messing everybody up. He raises the bar on everybody. We are redeemed because God in the flesh fulfilled the law and the prophets. That's the experience, okay? So this is why, and this is just kind of a side warning here, you got to take the scripture as a whole. You can't just pick out the parts that you like and get rid of the parts that you don't, okay? And, and in a way, this passage of scripture is Jesus reclaiming his story from us <laughs> and saying, quit pulling my story apart. Quit keeping for yourself the stuff that makes you feel better about yourself and getting rid of the stuff that makes you feel bad about yourself. This is my story. Quit messing with it. This is my story. And in fact, what he's saying is, now I want to invite you to look at my story through my eyes. We read scripture through the lens of Jesus. Through the lens of Jesus. And what it means is this. This all comes down to why we don't like that word sinner. So follow me here. <clears throat> With a mistake, you literally can just say, whoops, whoops. Uh, with a sin, there's responsibility, though. Again, the definition of sinner reveals that a person who transgresses against divine law by committing immoral acts or act, act, an immoral act or acts. Mistaker sounds better than sinner. It just sounds better. And here's why Jesus brings the law and the prophets up. If the wrong that I do is just a mistake, that makes me a mistaker. I need more than what a mistaker needs, though. Because here's the deal. In a moment of honesty, some of those things aren't mistakes. Some of those things are not mistakes. Calling them for what they are doesn't feel good. Their decisions. Their decisions to sin. Now, I know this isn't fun stuff. It's why I made the video at the beginning, so make you laugh. Jesus throws in verse 19. If anybody sets aside one of the least of these, teaches others accordingly, they're going to be called least in the kingdom. But whoever practices and teaches these will be called great in the kingdom. Can I translate? Jesus is not lowering the standard. He's raising it. He's raising it for everybody. He's not trying to create better law followers. He's trying to build up heart givers. That's what he's doing. He's not looking for law followers. He's looking for heart givers because when he has your heart, he has all of you. The other stuff follows. Are you following me there? The other stuff follows. Let me say it a different way. People who live out of a right heart, that's what he's after. People who live out of a right heart, not out of a right obligation, there are a whole lot of people who know the rules and try to keep the rules and love to point out to how other people don't follow those rules and they've missed something in that rule keeping and rule following, the heart, the person, the image of God that we see in one another. And we destroy other people. We question their lived experiences out of an obligation we have 
to the law, but God's asking us to give everything over. Everything over. The book of Romans says your act of worship is being a living sacrifice, putting yourself on the altar. Not this, not that, all of you on the altar. And when God's got all of you on the altar, it's amazing the things in your life that you're willing to do. And the things in your life you're no longer willing to do. That's what God is after. He's after our hearts. They love to keep the letter of the law, the the Pharisees, and, and Jesus throws this out there, and this is where Jesus takes the religious people off. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of the heaven, at which point the Pharisees are standing in line like, whoa, hold up. Like, we're the experts here. We were with you a little bit on the stuff that you were saying, but now you're telling us that their righteousness has to exceed our righteousness. If anybody's going to be a part of your kingdom, you just jumped over us. What are you doing? How does this work? Let me say it again in a different way. They wanted to be keepers of the law, the ones deciding what holiness looked like. They loved to keep the letter of the law, but they did not live the spirit of the law. They wanted to keep the letter of the law, but they did not live the spirit of the law. It's one thing to try to keep the letter of the law. It's another thing to live it, to live the spirit of the law. I should, and this is a dumb example, not want to drive 78 in a 55 because I know it protects the lives of people, not because I have to. Are you following me? God's after our heart. He's not just after our obedience to a list of rules. Now, those rules existed for a reason, though. And Jesus is saying, I didn't come just to toss those things out. I came to fulfill those things. Okay, so it's another thing to live the spirit of the law. And I don't want to get too far ahead, uh, because in the weeks ahead, we're going to jump into things Jesus reclaims from religious people, and it gets wild. Okay, so like next week, verse 21, you've heard that it was said, do not murder. Ding, ding, ding. I can check that one off the list. I've never stabbed anybody in the neck with a knife. I've, you know, I've, never, like, I've never murdered anybody. All right. Okay, Jesus, you're, you're speaking my language. But then he keeps talking. I tell you, anybody who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. What is Raka? Raka is a word that describes basically, this is disgusting, hawking up a loogie, thinking you're going to spit it on that person, thinking you're not even worth my spit, and you spit it over there. Nice, huh? Do you want me to illustrate? Okay, I I won't. And anybody, this is crazy, and anybody he says, who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Okay, hold up. Hold up. Jesus is saying hatred is as bad as murder? Are you kidding me? Then he really levels the playing field. He just keeps going. He just unravels one after another. Verse 27, you've heard it was said, do not commit adultery. Ding, ding, ding. Never done it. Never done it. I'm good here, Jesus. We, in fact, we don't have to talk about this anymore, but Jesus keeps talking. But I tell you that anybody who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Whoa, 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 hang on. Hang on. But he just keeps going. Verse 43, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Yeah, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Mm, What are you doing? Like, you're, you're messing with all of my stuff, Jesus. I've been keeping these rules. I've not committed adultery. I've not murdered anybody. And you're coming along and you're saying, that's not enough. That's not enough. What you're describing is something that nobody can do. And Jesus says, ding, 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 bingo. Now you get it. You can't live out the spirit of this perfectly you can try and when you fail you can say well those are just mistakes but you have a bigger issue and it is this issue of sin his listeners were groomed to try harder they were groomed to think of themselves as mistakers and not sinners but you know as as well as I do, that some of those actions, those words that we we spew out that have caused pain and relational death, those aren't mistakes. 
They're not mistakes. They come from something. That's why Jesus' great reclamation message begins with, blessed are those who admit they're broken. See, if you admit you're broken, then when the, the answer for your unbrokenness is given to you, you're ready for it. But you can't get it unless you say, I'm, I'm spiritually poor. I'm, I'm broken. They're the ones that are going to be filled. He says, blessed are those who mourn over their own hearts, the own state of their heart. They're the ones that are going to be able to be comforted, not the self-justifiers, not the, the self-proclaimed mistakers. It's the honest sinners who are going to be blessed, even transformed, co-heirs in Jesus' kingdom. In uh, 2015, the Luis Palau Association uh, contacted me. Luis Palau was basically the Argentinian Billy Graham. <laughs> uh, if you know who Billy Graham was, but uh, some of you know my story, some of you don't. Um, my admission of poverty of spirit, my moment, happened on May 16th, 1992. Uh, Luis Palau came to my town. Uh, he had filled stadiums, he, he did, he filled stadiums all around the world. And then he showed up at the Peoria Civic Center in Peoria, Illinois. <laughs> and uh, uh, they contacted me in 2015 because they were doing a follow-up video as a part of a series on how God had worked in people's lives uh, who had gave their lives to Jesus at a Luis Palau event. We were pastoring in Racine, Wisconsin at the time. And so this film crew came. It was quite humbling, actually. Uh, from Portland, Oregon, this film crew was sent, and they spent a couple days with us interviewing us and and different things like that. Uh, you can see the full version online. In fact, I think on your weekly, there's a little QR code you can scan and stuff to watch that later. But um, I want to show you just a clip, a short, short little clip of this video that they made. And, and I want to do it for a reason, because I think that this summarizes and encapsulates the issue that Jesus is getting at in this situation. I know I shared this a little bit when I, when I first came to be your pastor a few years ago. But uh, I just want you to watch just very, very briefly this little clip before we close this out. I was pretty much very good at figuring out how to bend all angles towards myself. And then it was my senior year of high school and I met a girl whose dad was an answering pastor. And that was my first introduction to the church. And that all led then to this moment where uh, I was invited to this Luis Palau uh, event. And I didn't know who Luis Palau was. I didn't really care at that point. But I remember the music. I remember a lot of energy going on. I, I remember Luis getting up and speaking. And you can have eternal life if you repent and open your heart to Jesus. Jesus makes a difference. And I hope you all receive him. There's some specific things he spoke about. So, oh, thanks. <clears throat> There's a point in that video where I said that as he was up there speaking, uh, and he said something about, you know, God sees what's in your heart. Uh, and then I said in that video, I knew I was in trouble. Um, not in trouble like, you're going to hell. Not that kind of trouble. I knew I was in trouble because I came to this crossroads moment where I recognized okay, 
um, God's doing something. I can't explain it. I can't argue it away. And so I got I to do something. And I knew that that was my moment. Um, in a moment, we're going to participate in communion. Uh, and maybe today, you're realizing like I did that you can try and play the part. Um, I had convinced myself at that point that even I could fool my pastor's wife, girl, or pastor's daughter's, my pastor daughter girlfriend. My wife is sitting right there. It wasn't her. <laughs> um, but I, I, was, I was convinced that I could fool everybody about how I was doing spiritually, but God saw what was in my heart. I was a mistaker. And I made some mistakes. I'm sorry. You know, I made some mistakes. I'm not as bad as the other guy. I'm doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. And I could have I could have kept grinding on that. I really could. Um, but at the end of the day, God saw what was in my heart. And I knew, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that he knew what was going on in my heart. And I needed a, a new heart. <laughs> I needed I needed I needed a change that I couldn't create. I, I needed to be different. Not because there's anything horrible about Rich Doring. I'm still Rich Doring. But I'm Rich Doring, and it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. And that has made all the difference. Um, you may be sitting here and thinking, you know, you can try and play the part, not break a, a command, you know, not make some mistakes. But you realize that God sees your heart today. Those laws are not bad. They're just not enough. They just point to a deeper issue, a heart need. And when you deal with that, that's where real life begins. That's where stuff you never dreamed of could begin to take place. It's a life of freedom. It's a life of peace. It's a life of joy, fullness. Jesus says that if you do that, you're blessed. He'll fill you. He'll fill you. He'll comfort you. That blessing, that forgiveness of that sin in our lives, of falling short, came at a price. Jesus gave his perfectly lived life of love and sinlessness for ours. He gave his life for you. My question is, have you put your faith in what Jesus has done for you? Have you done that? Many of you have, most of you, I would even say have. Maybe some of you in here have not ever walked across that line and said, I'm going to put my stock in Jesus. I'm going, to, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus and recognize that there's things in my life that I just need to give to him and admit that I have a need and allow him to give you this gift of grace and forgiveness, cleansing your heart from sin, setting you free. I want to invite you to pray with me right now. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm just going to pray a prayer. And if this you and you want to pray that right where you are, I want to encourage you to do that, but I think we need to do that before we go to communion today and what it represents. So, Father, I just, I come before you today, and I admit that there are things in my life, decisions that I've made that have separated me from you and others. Father, I admit that there is sin in my life. But Father, I also believe that Jesus Christ came, that he lived this life perfectly. And Father, out of his deep love for us, laid down his life for ours. Yet he beat death. He rose from the grave. And I believe today that he offers me forgiveness and mercy and grace. And so, Father, I put my faith in Jesus today. Not in myself. Not in my inherent goodness or good works. Father, I don't want to live my life that way anymore. I want to live my life with Jesus as the head of my life. So that it is no longer I who live but it's Jesus who lives in me. So I confess today Jesus is my Savior. And I put my faith in him today and for all eternity.
Amen. If you prayed that, I would love for you to just write your name, maybe a little contact information. I promise you I won't haunt you or anything, but um, your name, a little contact information, and then just write a, draw a big old star on the back of that Connect card, on the back of that Next Steps card, so I can get a hold of you and walk with you on that journey. I'm proud of you. It's the biggest step. You think I knew what I was doing <laughs> back on May 16th, 1992? I can guarantee you I didn't think I'd be doing this. Okay, That might scare some of you. <laughs> Uh, well, don't want to scare you because God's got amazing plans and dreams for you, and I'm just proud of you for taking that step. So I'd love for you to share that with me. In the meantime, this very thing is the thing that Jesus did for us. It came at a cost, and that cost was his body, his blood, which was spilled for us. And so as we move towards communion today, I want to encourage you as you came in to uh, grab that cup. And on one side of that is the bread. If you would take that out, I'd like to ask you to do that if you would. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat down for a meal with his disciples. He broke bread, he passed it around, he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which will be broken for you. So every time that you eat this bread, I want you to remember that my body was broken for you, and so we do the same. I ask that you prepare the, the other side. That same meal, Jesus took something that they did all the time, and he gave it powerful new meaning. That there's a new co covenant that's going to be established. It's going to be established. My blood is going to be the seal of that establishment, that covenant. So my blood is about to be spilt for you. So every time that you drink this, every time you come together and receive this, I want you to remember that my blood was spilt out of my deep, deep, abiding love for each of you. So we do the same. I'm going to ask you if you would to stand, if you can. As you leave this room today, you are invited to enter the community space right over there by the coffee shop, coffee house. And uh, there's opportunities for you to pour yourself out for others as well. Our Serve the Region projects are coming up here in a couple weeks. Still have some spots, some availability. So if you've not had a chance to do that, I would just love, love, love to see you guys head in there and sign up for a few projects. And would you help me in just thanking those that are leading those projects today? That's a big ask. And so thank you guys for, for leading those projects. You guys are amazing. You're rock stars. Let me pray for you. Father, uh, your grace is amazing. And so we have received it today. I pray that it would go with us, that uh, you would continue to use us and guide us and direct us. Help us walk in step with the Spirit today. Father, if there are those that have prayed today to receive Christ, I pray that you would just allow them to experience a transformation today where it's just a clear mark. There was, there was me before and now there's me after. And it's all because of what you've done. So I pray, Father, for each of them, that you would strengthen them and guide them and help us to glorify you in everything that we say and do today, it's in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here today. God bless you.